welcome to yet another episode of Guest Room. This is me, Anjali, here with you. Today, we have a special guest. He is the president of British Institute of Radiology. Let us welcome Dr. David Wilson to the show. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. So, before going deeper into the subject, we would like to know more about your early education and career life. Well, I was born in Birmingham, mm -hmm. in central England, and then I grew up in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. um, actually, interesting, in a largely Asian community, because my father was a general practitioner, and so a lot of my friends were from this subcontinent. Um, and I think by the age of 12, I'd been to more Sikh weddings than I had to Christian weddings. Okay. Um, after that, I then decided to follow my father's footsteps and went to London to study medicine. Um, spent eight years in London altogether. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of that, I thought I was going to be a physician specializing probably in chest medicine. Okay. And I reached the senior registrar level uh, and then thought, I don't think I want to do this. And I can't really work out why. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem quite right for me. And I looked around and saw in the British Medical Journal there was a training position in radiology advertised mm -hmm. in Oxford. Uh, I applied, I got the job and never left and I've been in Oxford ever since. Mm -hmm. And how and when did you find your interest in the area of modern imaging? Well, it was the training was in those days was just x-rays. Um, we had a little bit of nuclear medicine, that means giving radioactive substances to people mm -hmm. and then taking images afterwards. But in the... Um, when I started, a whole lot of new technology arrived, and within, within a decade, we were using ultrasound, CT, MRI, mm -hmm. and a lot of new techniques. I decided to specialize in bone and joint problems, um, so arthritis, um, people with spine problems. Mm -hmm. and we call it musculoskeletal, because it means muscles and skeleton. And I've had the opportunity over my career to introduce every new technique, and that's been very exciting, because a new technique would arrive and we would think, how can we use this in our, in our musculoskeletal practice? And that's been very exciting. And so I've spent a career looking at new developments, mm -hmm. and we still are. We still have new techniques developing. Could you tell us more about modern imaging and its techniques? Well, um, we use scanners. People use the word scanners, and it, mm -hmm. it can mean almost anything because we have lots of machines that are called scanners. Um, probably the um, simplest one is the old-fashioned X-ray. Um, Röntgen was the um, professor in Germany who discovered X-rays and realized that um, radiation was a useful way of taking pictures. In fact, he took an X-ray of his wife's hand. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous picture of her wedding ring on her, on her I think it must be her left hand. Okay. Um, then we use that to look at people, and that is the old technique, but that's advanced considerably. Um, in the 1970s, Godfrey Hounsfield uh, in Britain uh, developed CT scanning, where you take a fine beam of X-ray, mm -hmm. pass it through the patient, and use a computer to analyze the amount of data. Um, it measures how much X-ray has been absorbed, and that can give us slices. And we th it's a bit like we slice somebody up, and we see a mm -hmm. series of sections. So we call that cross-sectional imaging. We've divided the person into sections. Much more detail, still X-ray. About the time that was being developed, along came an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. It uses sound waves. Mm -hmm. uh, with ultrasound, we use a probe. It looks like a paintbrush. Okay. We place it on the patient, um, and in my area, on a muscle or a joint. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, many uh, ladies who've had babies will have had this ultrasound examination of the baby before they were born. Mm -hmm. And we can see the soft structures, like the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles, the liver, and okay. other structures inside the body. And the great advantage of that technique is it doesn't use any radiation, so there's no oh. risk. Okay. Sound waves only, and mm -hmm. we know of no harm that comes to anybody from having this. Mm -hmm. Actually, so much so as I test our machines on myself, okay. just to check they're working properly. <laughs> okay. A little later on, um, MRI was developed, mm -hmm. and that is... Well, I actually learnt all the physics, and I trained in that, how it works. It mm -hmm. works with magnetic fields and radio signals. So again, there's nothing harmful to the person. We don't know of any side effects from it. But the physics behind it is so complex. Mm -hmm. And I usually understand it for a brief while after I read the book, and then it gets confusing. So I've decided that as a practical radiologist, I just need to know that it works. So if I imagine it works by magic, that's quite a good way. <laughs> What it does is produces pictures, okay. which are like slices through the body. Uh -huh. um, we look at the bones as well as the soft tissues. It produces pictures almost in any direction you want. And we can shade the pictures to show up different areas that have got disease in them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if somebody has a cancer, the areas 
affecting the bone will show up as white okay. whilst the rest of the bones look black on a particular image. Mm -hmm. So it's a very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. The drawback is they're very expensive. Yeah. Um, they cost about a million UK pounds, so add two noughts onto that, so that's a hundred million rupees. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're very powerful technique. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on. There's a lot more technology. Um, we can inject radio pharmaceuticals. That's a drug mm -hmm. uh, which is produced from a, an accelerator. And that is a radioactive material which decays quickly. Mm -hmm. It gives the patient a small radiation dose, not much about the same as going up in an aeroplane for an hour, because we get higher up in the air, we get a little mm. more radiation. Um, what we then do is measure the amount of radiation with a, sc a scanning device, okay. and we can combine that picture with the MRI or the CT pictures and fuse them together so we can see areas which are metabolically active. Let's say you have a, a fracture which is just beginning. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, young people going into the armed forces, mm -hmm. um, they go from a fairly inactive life sometimes to being very, very active, yes. route marchers, and they develop stress injuries in their bones. Mm -hmm. They develop pain in their feet or their mm -hmm. shins, and the x-rays look normal because mm -hmm. the bone hasn't broken, but it's got an internal stress. If we scan them with MRI, that's the magnet system, then the bone looks edematous, that means it's got water in it, and we can see the area that's about to break. So we can prevent the break by saying, you mustn't do that for a while till that settles. And we can do the same thing with these radio pharmaceuticals, because that will go into the area of active bone. So all these yes. gives a better view? They give us different diagnoses. They, they give us more information. Mm -hmm. And one of the skills in radiology, and all the people at the Congress that were attending the Indian Congress, they're learning which is the best technique for a particular indication. Mm -hmm. um, so if we take that young soldier um, mm -hmm. who's got pain and say, have they got a stress fracture, we could use all of the techniques we've been talking about, but the role of the radiologist is to say, well, I think the best one, because the most sensitive thing for this diagnosis would be, and they may, for example, say an MRI scan, because that will show edema. Okay. Um, so it's, that's part of the skill, is choosing the technique that you're going to use. Okay. And what are the latest advancements in the field of CT and MRI? In MRI, it's really fusion of the images with other techniques. So I was talking about how we can give um, these radioactive compounds and then put the images together. So that's, and we call it, um, the most latest one is positron-emitted tomography, which is PET, P-E-T, mm. so it's a nice word to yeah. use. And there, the radioactive particles, when they decay and produce radiation, the radiation is emitted at 180 degrees, so two particles fly off in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. So if you put a detector on each side and a radioactive event occurs, you know it must have come from this spot in the middle okay. um, because they occur simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So you can plot where they come from. Then the MRI pictures, which looks like an anatomical model, give you a map. And it's a bit like having a map of the country and the areas with a lot of population are shining bright. Mm -hmm. So these are the area where the disease this is, is they shine up as bright. Mm -hmm. So that's a major advance and we're mm -hmm. gradually learning how this technique can be used. In fact, I heard a lecture yesterday on exactly that technique and how mm -hmm. they're using it in different types of cancer. Okay. Um, so making the diagnosis more accurate and more mm -hmm. sensitive. An area that I'm specializing in is using imaging to guide needle injections. So here's another example an elderly lady who has soft bones mm -hmm. uh, may fracture her spine without any injury. In fact, one of my patients said she was doing the washing up, mm -hmm. she lifted a plate and her spine broke. Oh. And terrible pain. Um, and that will get better after about two to three months. But in that time, you'd have to take morphine. It's very painful, very mm -hmm. bad. So one of our treatments that we have now is that we inject into the bone where mm -hmm. the fracture is plastic material. It okay. looks like honey. Mm -hmm. And we inject it using images to guide us. So we need to know exactly where to put it. And we have television pictures, which we can watch, mm -hmm. which have a picture of where we're putting the needle. We can place it in the correct position, in a safe position, mm -hmm. inject this plastic material, which hardens the fracture and kills the pain. So that's a really major area. So now radiologists, rather than just making diagnosis, are actually treating people as well. And on some occasions, we're the only doctors treating them because they come to us 
um, particularly with this fracture, I will see people from their family doctor, mm -hmm. I'll make the diagnosis using scans, we'll decide on the injection treatment, we'll undertake the treatment in a hospital, look after the patient, discharge them, see them a month later. Mm -hmm. So that's why we call ourselves clinical radiologists, because we act as treatment doctors as well as diagnostic doctors. Mm -hmm. And is there any do's and don'ts that they have to follow before getting these injections? This condition I'm talking about is called osteoporosis. It's mm -hmm. softening the bones. Every single one of us gets it. Um, ladies start with um, less bone than men. So my wife tells me that's because I'm very dense, but I think she's joking there. <laughs> it's because the uh, bone in men is, if we have, a man has 100% at the age of 20, a woman's bone is about 80%. So okay. if you then go forward 40, 50 years, then women reach the point of fractures earlier than men. Mm -hmm. Now that men are growing older, I'm seeing a lot more male patients, so it's not exclusive to men. What we say is when these fractures occur, it's a bit too late. We should have treated it early. Mm -hmm. So what we're now trying to do, um, as a medical profession, and it's the same in India I know because I've been talking to people the last few days about it, um, we're trying to prevent the condition happening. Mm -hmm. So we're saying your lifestyle should give you enough calcium, that's usually dairy products, mm -hmm. and if you don't drink a lot of milk and cheese and yogurt, then you probably need to have some calcium. You need lots of vitamin D. That's much easier in Kerala, Kerala mm -hmm. than it is in Oxford. In Oxford it's snowing at the moment. There, there's not very much light, and the light um, gives you vitamin D. Yes. So we say people in the northern country should take vitamin D as well, mm -hmm. but not in Kerala. I don't think mm -hmm. you need it here. But then, even then, it may be your family have a tendency to get it more. So you perhaps ought to have your bones checked when you're in your 50s, maybe 60. Mm -hmm. um, and then that will prevent disease. So we're, we're warning people that we can treat disease, and in fact, the radiologists come in there because we do all the scans and tests to find out whether the bones are thin. Mm -hmm. Once the fracture occurs, we all say to people, well, it might get better in a few weeks, so we'll give you painkillers. And the people that get better, we don't need to treat. And only the ones that haven't got better do mm -hmm. we go on to the more complicated types of treatment. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by congenital hip dyslexia? About 1 in 50 people, and this varies a little bit with populations. It's less common in African Caribbeans. It's about the same in Asians, Caucasians. Mm -hmm. It's about 1 in 50 of the population are born with a shallow hip. Okay. Your hip is like a ball and a socket. The okay. pelvis is a socket, and mm -hmm. the, your thigh bone at the end has a ball, and it fits into the socket. Mm -hmm. Now, we think this is primarily due to a genetic uh, issue. That means that certain families have a tendency to have shallow cups. Mm -hmm. So if the cup in which the ball fits is shallow when the baby is born, then there's a tendency before the ligaments and the muscles strengthen for the hip to slip out of place. Okay. We used to recognize this as being dislocation of the hip, mm -hmm. and it was called congenital, which means childhood born with it. Dislocation means the joint is out of socket, and obviously the hip. We then realized that there are, for uh, one in 50 um, uh, incidents of a problem, but of those people, only a very small minority actually dislocate completely, mm -hmm. and that's probably near a one in 500, maybe one in a thousand, depending mm -hmm. on the population. And we only, as a medical profession, realized that this was an issue when an infant didn't walk at the age of one year. Most children walk by mm -hmm. time that a year. If they don't walk, it may be that their hip has always been dislocated. Okay. So that was a rare but a big problem mm -hmm. um, because operations were needed in an infant and it's really disabling. So in the 1950s, it was decided to examine every newborn baby and every healthcare system in the world does this so that the family doctor or the obstetrician or the um, healthcare visitor will check children's hips to make sure that they move properly. We realized in the 1980s that there was another group of people, and that's the other 49 out of the 50, um, who um, had got, um, and it's probably about, I guess about 95, 90, 95% of people mm -hmm. um, who have a hip problem, didn't actually know they had a problem because they were born, they would walk at the age of one year. When they reached about 35 to 40, they suddenly developed arthritis in the hip because it had been shallow all that time and slipping slightly. Mm -hmm. and it wears out quickly. And it's said that the 
people under the age of 55 who need a hip operation, it's usually because they were born with that problem. Okay. So this is an unknown illness and there are a lot of us who have shallow hips and don't know we've got it. Okay. Um, a friend of mine at the rowing club, where I'm the chairman, I row as well, um, said to me, I've got a problem with my hip, she's 40, mm -hmm. um, would you take an x-ray, which we did, and we said, well you've had a shallow hip since you were born and you now have arthritis and mm -hmm. sadly you're going to end up with a hip replacement very early in life. So what we're now looking at is ways in which we can prevent that happening. Mm -hmm. So this examination that all doctors and healthcare people do of moving the hip around is one that um, is done in all healthcare systems but that will only detect the dislocations and they're a small percentage of the problem. We now have a technique using ultrasound, that's the sound wave technique, to look at newborn babies' hips to mm -hmm. see whether they are likely to become wobbly and therefore develop arthritis. Mm -hmm. And the reason for doing this is in a really, really simple treatment. You have about two months after birth. In, mm -hmm. the first, in the first few weeks, it's not a problem, but by about four weeks, you have now six weeks, six to eight weeks maybe, of opportunity to treat them. If you treat them then, it's very simple. You simply put the baby into a little splint, a harness, mm -hmm. so their legs are held apart. And the mothers doing this find it very easy because actually it's easier to look after them. They don't wiggle around so much. <laughs> and the babies don't know because by the time you've taken it off, the mm -hmm. age of maybe two months, they're not really aware. So it's a very benign treatment and it actually cures this hip problem. Mm -hmm. So for a very simple treatment, if we could apply that, then we would prevent 40 years later these people getting arthritis. And that's why we're looking at different ways of scanning using sound waves to get a more sensitive diagnosis. Okay. And that's what I'm talking about in the conference. Okay. And what will happen or, or what treatments could be given to the people who is having CHD at the age of 40? Well, at the age of 40, really, you're in real trouble then. Um, and in fact, that's something we do in our practice. We treat people, first of all, with injections into the hip joint. Mm -hmm. We use the imaging to guide the injections. We inject drugs like steroids, which are anti-inflammatory, but they can actually cause damage themselves. So they're not a, a mild treatment, they're a strong mm -hmm. treatment. We can also inject drugs that lubricate the joint and make it move more easily as a compound called hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. It's a natural product. The joints normally have a small amount of it in there. If we put a high concentration in with an injection, that seems to help. But actually, these treatments simply put off the inevitable. The inevitable is that they will need a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually the end outcome of having an arthritic hip in your 40s. That's a big problem because if you're older, like me in early 60s, or if you're even older in your 70s or 80s, then one hip replacement will probably last you. Um, mm -hmm. of your whole life. Okay. But if you're younger, then you use your hip more and it tends to break. So having a hip replacement at age 40 means probably two, three, maybe four operations replacing the replaced hip because they mm -hmm. wear out okay. and they wear out even faster. So anything we can do for newborn babies to try and prevent this is very good news. Mm -hmm. So coming to your institute, could you tell us more about BIR? Right, well, I'm president of the British Institute of Radiology. It's the oldest radiological organization in the world. It was founded two years after Röntgen discovered x-rays, so it's now well over 100 years old. And it was a society of doctors and medical people who wanted to use radiation, mm -hmm. um, both for diagnosis, as I do, for treatment, as I do in part of my work, but also for radiation therapy, which I don't personally do, but we have people doing mm -hmm. radiation therapy in our, our organization. So we have people who are doctors who use radiation for diagnosis and treatment. We have physicists who operate the machinery and set up the standards and the quality um, and are looking at the basic sciences. We have the radiographers who in America are called technicians, but they're the people that take the images and take the pictures who are also members of society. Mm -hmm. And we have other scientists who are interested in other aspects. And in fact, we have some um, clinical doctors and some physical therapists who are interested in the imaging. And we try and promote education. Mm -hmm. So we are, at the moment, really developing online education with a new Great. team of uh -huh. people, some webinars, some online learning, which is available worldwide. Um, we also try and um, help with the standardization and the guidance and guidelines uh, for different treatment techniques. Um, 
and we're an organization to help each other so that we work together and collaborate and have ideas. We have groups and committees who will share ideas and share knowledge. Mm -hmm. We publish a journal which is again the oldest radiological journal in the world, that's the British Journal of Radiology. Mm -hmm. And I must say that having been the deputy editor, a lot of the material comes from India. Uh, we have a lot okay. of submissions. We as an organization are now trying to promote international links. Mm -hmm. Because we've got the electronic learning which can take place anywhere, we think that um, what we call overseas members um, yes. can benefit a great deal. In fact, just on my way out here, my uh, the team told me that we've had four new Indian members because mm -hmm. of this Congress, which was great. Oh, yeah. um, and so they have access to all the online learning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the organization is. I'm here to promote links with India. I'm about mm -hmm. to talk to the president of the Indian Association yes. in the next 24 hours to try and promote some learning, some combined ideas and links. Okay. And as the uh, president of BIR, what challenges do you face? First of all, there is um, keeping a multidisciplinary organization going means that we have to address the academic interests of all the different groups. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be very disparate. We look at the different specialist areas and we try and deal with that. So that's one aspect. The next is advancing technology. Um, webinars to you in television production mm -hmm. will seem straightforward. It's your everyday work. But for many of us, it's new and yes. we're not used to looking at um, television cameras uh, and to try and talk to mm -hmm. other people and explain mm -hmm. what you're doing isn't instinctive. Mm -hmm. So we've had to learn that. Okay. Um, in the same way, we um, modern communications means that we can communicate all over the world. And that's a challenge because we have different cultural groups, there's different time zones, um, there's diff different educational expectations. But you, I hope you'll gather that it's very interesting and it's mm -hmm. fascinating doing this. Mm -hmm. And what is the future of BIR? Where do you see BIR in the next five years? I would like to see us expanding our uh, membership to lots of different specialities. Anybody who is in the medical field who uses imaging or actually refers for imaging would benefit to be part of our organization. They'll understand the techniques, the methods better um, and obtain quite a few benefits in both professional and academic world. Um, so I think we want to get bigger. We also need to um, enhance the electronic communications. Mm -hmm. We want to be have a big online presence. We have an ambitious project to try and accredit training. And what I mean by that is that you might attend a lecture or a course, and maybe it isn't so good. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it is good, we don't know. So we've set up now a panel who are going to look at all the training courses that wish to submit to this process mm -hmm. and say, yes, this is a good educational standard. You're producing material of the correct form. It's a teaching method that's good. We would advise you try this method or different methods. Now, the strength of this system is that if we can accredit teaching, and that means electronic teaching, lectures, books, whatever, then we can say, well, if you do these teaching sessions in this specialist area, we would consider you eligible to take a diploma on examination. Mm -hmm. um, so we're setting up a diploma system. Mm. The very first one we're going to do is um, uh, one of my imaging areas, which is musculoskeletal bone and joint ultrasound. Um, at the moment, lots of different professionals do this. There are radiologists like myself. There are sports physicians like my wife, um, there are rheumatologists, there are physical therapists, there are orthopedic surgeons, lots of different people using the technique. There isn't a common standardized training. So we thought, let's develop a training scheme. We okay. have developed that and we're nearly about to launch it. And that's a big future for us. That's an important part of our development. Okay. Before uh, winding up, could you tell us more about musculoskeletal? Musculoskeletal imaging is, means finding out the problems of people with joint problems. So that's somebody who has joint pain, mm -hmm. somebody who wakes in the morning with joint stiffness. It also means people who have broken bones, who've had fractures and injuries. It means people who have got um, more serious disease like cancer, like bone cancer. It means investigating and treating people with um, the complications of muscle injuries. So that might be the sports person or mm -hmm. it might be someone playing cricket at the weekend. Um, 
So it's all aspects of what we call the locomotor system, the thing that helps us move around. That mm -hmm. includes the spine. Um, so that's the musculoskeletal speciality. Mm -hmm. Within that area, there are rheumatologists who deal with inflamed joints mm -hmm. and painful joints. There are their physicians. There are orthopedic surgeons who do operations on bones and joints and muscles. There are physical therapists who treat people who've had injuries and mm -hmm. have, are getting over operations on their joints. And then there's my team, who are the imagers. We're the people that help with making the diagnosis, finding out what's wrong, mm -hmm. and doing a lot of the guided treatment techniques where we use imaging to guide the placement of needles and devices. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a big area, and it's got a lot of different specialities. And one of the, um, the, one of the skills is to get all those people working together. Because a patient just says to their doctor, my knee hurts. Mm -hmm. And then their family doctor has to say, well, I think you've probably got an inflamed knee. I'll send you to a rheumatologist. But on the way, go and see the radiologist to get a scan and find out what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And the rheumatologist may say, take these tablets, but you'll need to also see a physical therapist to okay. help you get better. Physical therapist may say to me, it's not getting better. Do you think you could give him an injection? So it's that team approach, which is, is key to the process. Mm -hmm. And we call it multidisciplinary. And that's... That's actually what the BIR does as well. We have mm -hmm. a multidisciplinary system over the whole of imaging. Musculoskeletal is one area, but again, the future is mm -hmm. all working together, helping each other, learning from each other, and helping our patients get better. Okay. And lastly, what message would you like to give to the audience? I think to say that we're a global community. Um, we, as medical professionals, and that's all medical professions in all aspects of it, from the basic scientists to the people who are actually looking after the patients in the hospital, the nurses, uh, the physical therapists, the pathology in the laboratories. We all work together as a team. Up until the last few years, that's happened in a city, for example, mm -hmm. and maybe people at different hospitals talk to each other. Now we can talk all over the world. So in a moment, we can get an opinion from someone in Singapore or someone in South America or wherever. And I think we have to learn to do that much better in a more efficient way. Because if we do that, we'll share knowledge, we'll share skills. We'll also share understanding of how diseases happen differently in different countries. Just this morning at a lecture at the Congress, mm -hmm. I learned a lot about infection rates and how in a more tropical climate, that makes an issue. So actually, the patients are treated rather differently um, for some of the injections we give in Kerala than they are in Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, and that's important because it may be that somebody who has been here in Kerala, the next day is in Oxford and I'm looking at them and I have to understand that the disease processes work slightly differently. So I think the final message is communication. Let's all work together, share mm -hmm. ideas, and I think we'll improve healthcare for everybody. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for spending your valuable time with us. It's a pleasure. So, that was Dr. David Wilson with us. Until we meet next time, this is me, Anjali, signing off. Take care.